Hi there, and welcome to kickoff weekend for Polar Dino Fest, a 10 week exploration of the world of polar dinosaurs. My name is Randy Ermis. I'm the chief curator and curator of paleontology here at the Natural History Museum of Utah, where I'm sitting right now in the paleo collections. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind everyone to kick off Polar Dino Fest. Uh, we are hosting a total of six live stream panels this weekend with a total of 12 wonderful paleontologists from across the globe. Following this live stream, we have another one at 5 p.m. Mountain Time today, and then three more tomorrow starting at 11 a.m. So I encourage you all to check that out. Uh, these live conversations kick off 10 weeks of polar dinosaur exploration as we release a new video from one of our guest paleontologists each Friday at 10 a.m. Mountain between now and April 2nd. You can see the complete schedule of our live conversations and all the video release dates on our website at nhmu.utah.edu slash dinofest. And we encourage everyone to submit their questions for this live stream via the website, Facebook, or YouTube. And hello to all of you who have already turned, tuned in out there. Um, so now let's get started. Um, I'm really excited to introduce my two guests uh, this live stream. Uh, first, we have Dr. Pat Druckenmiller, who is the director of the University of Alaskan Museum of the North, as well as a professor of geology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Hi there, Pat. Hello. Hello. And we're also joined by Dr. Karen Clayson, a paleoichthyologist and professor of anatomy uh, at the Department of Biomedical Sciences at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Hi there, Karen. Hi. Well, I have to start out by asking you, Karen, what is a paleoichthyologist? <laughs> That's a specialized paleontologist who focuses on fish. Very cool. And so how does a paleontologists specializing on fish get to teach uh, human anatomy. I know that th that's pretty common actually for paleontologists. It seems kind of weird. How it does, it does seem weird to, at first. And then you get to know that a lot of what paleontologists do is anatomical. And so there's a lot of applied anatomy. And I did a lot of training starting as an undergrad in two different departments, in a geology department and an anatomy department. And it just followed me for every step of the way with my education and ultimately postdoc and how I chose uh, a job. And so, yeah, I started in Philadelphia uh, nine years ago. And before that, I was at another school that was a med school too. It just uh, seems like a natural path that you can take. Cool. And I hope all of your uh, anatomy students embrace their inner fish, of course. <laughs> I got to use the term, we are all fish, just two days ago in lab. Absolutely, it happens routinely. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. And Pat, what's your specialty within paleontology? Uh, I, I work on kind of two different things. I, I, I live a dual world above and below the ocean, so I'm a marine reptile person studying plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs, um, many of those from polar regions. Um, but um, here in Alaska, a lot of my role centers around working on uh, polar dinosaurs from Alaska, which is, as it turns out, a great place to study the dinosaurs that lived at really high latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere. And did you start studying polar rept fossil reptiles because you uh, started working in Alaska or was that, did you do that even before you uh, moved to Alaska? Yeah, I started on uh, the marine reptile world um, some time ago uh, when I started out my, my master's degree work um, and it continued on, it has continued on ever since, but I'm now working in the, um, you know, focusing more on, on dinosaurs here in Alaska. Our marine rep, reptile record in Alaska is not as good as its dinosaur record. Very cool. Well, it's great that we have both poles represented, both the North Pole and South Pole here. Um, and in fact, not only uh, polar paleontology, but a polar paleontologist since Pat is in, in Fairbanks uh, uh, right yep. now. I live so, it every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we have some uh, great questions rolling in. Uh, and so without further ado, let's, uh, let's get started with, with some of those questions. And um, actually, this is, this is a nice one. It's a sort of more general question I'll ask for both of you. Uh, Zach on YouTube is asking, um, how can one get involved in, uh, in paleontology in any way? Can you volunteer? 
um, at a museum or, uh, or in another capacity. Um, I'll ask uh, Pat you first and then Karen after. Yeah, sure. I, it's, a good, it's a really good question because uh, a lot of us, I know um, when we're nurturing our interests in paleontology, it's important to find places to, to actually go and experience it and see if this is what you want to do with your life. And um, I would recommend uh, museums are often great places to start, uh, to check in, to see if there are volunteer programs for doing participating in dinosaur digs, for example, or other kinds of digs. And museums often have researchers who are looking to fill their field crew to sit down in a quarry for a, a very hot summer and um, excavate um, untold numbers of bones or, or maybe no bones, but that's the way, that's part of the fun, right? Um, so uh, likewise, professors at universities maybe aren't, you know, often have associations with museums as well. They're another place to check and there's not that many of us vertebrate paleontologists, so we're not hard to find and you may just inquire <laughs> directly and say, hey, do you need any help? And, um, you know, oftentimes I've many times uh, taken advantage of that free labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Karen, is there, could you say more about work, uh, working at a university? Sure. So I didn't actually choose to come into paleontology until I was um, an undergrad. So I found out about it through my professor. I didn't know you could become a pre professional paleontologist. I think I knew people studied dinosaurs, but didn't know much past that. Um, and then once I became interested, I actually joined a society called the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. There is a junior membership, so you can look at it if you are somebody who's interested. Um, but something else through the society is that there, there's an ambassadors program and an education and outreach program. And you can sometimes link up and partner with paleontologists through that mechanism if you don't know where to start to look for, for any, as, as Pat suggested, you can find us. And that's one source that you can look and find out more about what individual people are doing. Um, because paleontology is rather broad. It's not just dinosaurs. Even though this is the dino fest, I will <laughs> plug that there are lots of things that you can study in the fossil record. And so getting your exposure and trying things out, maybe you go to the museum and you get to walk around again someday once they open them up more <laughs> a little bit. Um, depending on where you are, you can sometimes uh, see preparation that's happening and maybe even get to talk to people who are working on fossils right then and there. And I think big, big for me is just asking, just saying hi to anybody that you see and, and finding out and just asking the question if you can get involved. I, I'll, I'll just follow up on that. Those are all really, really good points. And um, I, I think a lot of the people that I eventually might take into the field with me, I've, I've, I've tested in the lab. They come and work in my lab and do all sorts of things. Sometimes they're not always super exciting, but it's a way of finding out really how interested people are. Um, if they spend, uh, like if an undergraduate student spends a semester or two working with me and I say, hey, I've got a spot in the summer dig, I, if I know they've stuck it out, then um, they're at top of the list for people to come along. Yeah, totally. Well, so Karen, uh, one another, you know, great question. I think that, that a lot of people wonder about that came up is how do we know where to look? So, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's all these rocks out there and uh, exposed, but also I think a lot of people think of both the Arctic and Antarctica as being totally ice covered. So right. when you're out there, how do you know where to look and how do you look for your fossils? So we have to time it with the seasons um, because the amount of ice that we're going to find covering the continents will vary based on the, the season itself. When it's summertime, there will probably be some melt and we can expose parts of the coastline. And what we hope gets exposed is sedimentary rock. So there's different types of rock and one kind in particular is going to host these fossils. It's the types of rock that can actually, you can find them in. So we call that sedimentary. And so we would look for uh, exposures um, based on what we can see. Now we can use things like satellites and actually predict how much sea ice might be around and how much um, exposure there could be. But there's hundreds of years of people who have studied geology. And so it's a little more recent in Antarctica, but they have looked at the stratigraphy of the area so we know what kinds of rock there are. And if we know about how old they are, we can make predictions about what kind of fossils we should find in them or 
approximately by age. And then the other part is, is sometimes there's going to be freshwater, sometimes there's going to be marine. And so we can actually even predict even further the types of fossils that we might expect to find. And so we had uh, some good good guesses that we would find the types of um, animals we, we thought would actually be part of South America and Australia, because they used to connect to um, Antarctica. And so that, that was one of the things we were going to try and go if we could reach any land at all, we were going to look for fossils that we thought might look like them. And do you use the same process, Pat, in the Arctic? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my hat's off to the geologists who, through literally a century of work, or maybe even a little less in parts of Alaska, have been tr tromping through the wilderness. They're mm -hmm. often some of the first scientists who go into some of these remote areas, and they're documenting the rocks, and they are making these maps and those maps are fundamental to what we do because as Karen said it's like these are these are our predictions of where do you know the right rocks if the right rocks are there and they're the right age um, us in Alaska that that's I look at those maps and I say let's let's try there and a good example of that was several years ago we uh, we were looking at um, our geologic map of Alaska and um, oftentimes the rocks that are from the Cretaceous uh, period, which is one of the great dinosaur periods, uh, they're colored green on the map. And we were looking at the map of part of Alaska along the Yukon River and it said, there's some rocks there, they're green. I don't know anything about them. In fact, there's been very little published. Uh, let's go check them out. And we knew that there was some coal from these rocks and we thought there could either be bones or dinosaur tracks. So to get there, we, took a, we just took a chance. We launched a couple of boats in Fairbanks. We went 500 miles by boat down the Yukon River. And when we reached these special area of rocks, we found thousands and thousands of dinosaur tracks laying along the banks of the Yukon River. Wow. Because of it, all because we just simply took advantage of uh, how to read the map. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think about dinosaurs as being big animals, and sometimes they are, sometimes they're really small. So um, when you're digging up those dinosaurs in the Arctic, how long does it take? Is it, is it really hard multiple seasons to get out one skeleton? Is that for Antarctic or Arctic? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Arctic, for, for you, Pat. Go oh, ahead. for Arctic, yeah. You know, um, so far, when it comes to finding bones in Alaska, most of the sites that we've been finding um, are either one sort of one-off bones, like an isolated bone here or there, which we can generally excavate in one season, or they come in the form of a bone bed. So a layer of rock could be anywhere from five centimeters to almost a meter thick, full of dinosaur bones. Those sites absolutely can take years to excavate. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in fact, um, um, where I work, one of the, the great risks is uh, most of these rocks occur in northern Alaska up in the Arctic where um, they're exposed along the banks of a river, along the big river up there called the Colville River. And the only thing that holds that quote unquote rock together is permafrost. It's infiltrated with ice. When the ice melts in the summer, the, blo the bluffs like to fall on your head and kill you. Safety is kind of important. Um, I don't like to kill my field crew. No. So we're actually planning a winter excavation. We're leaving in about a month and a half to go up there while the rocks are frozen solid so that we can actually excavate a layer of rock that we know exists full of really cool stuff. And we're gonna chainsaw and rock saw and jackhammer those pieces of that bone bed out of the frozen ground without anything falling on our heads, we hope. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so how do you protect the fossil as it starts to thaw? When, uh, when we were pulling out some of these slabs of rock, they're going to stay frozen okay. until we get them into the lab. And we're going to do a kind of controlled thaw mm -hmm. and excavate as we go. So oh. that's, that's the theory. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Wow. And what are the, so the fossils fish that you find, Karen, are they in bone beds like Pat's talking about, or are they preserved? So in a sometimes way? they they would be um, in a bone bed, but other times they come in large concretions. Can I show you one? Yeah, that would be awesome. Okay, this is bigger than my head, but we might find what looks just like a rock. And if we split it open, we can find 
fossil bones inside. Oh, wow. They look about as thin as a potato chip because they are. It turns out fish bones are usually pretty thin. Um, but we have actually parts of a skull that's preserved in there very nicely. So when we're lucky, we find things like this. Um, a lot of other times we'll find tiny little pieces that might be isolated. Uh, we might find little pieces that are backbones, like, or not actually backbones. This is a shark, so it's a back cartilage. It's a spine um, or tiny little teeth. And depending on uh, where we are, we can pick those up and we can clean them off, put them in bags and take them home. Or with that, we have to put them in crates and take them by a ship, which takes several months to get from Antarctica back to the United States. And then they can be transported to our various museums and institutions. Cool. Well, that, that leads perfectly into a question from David on YouTube, who is wondering how the fish fossils that you find in Antarctica are similar or different to species found elsewhere in the world. So because these are marine, we actually find a lot of similarity based on the time that we're looking at. In fact, um, the Western Interior Seaway, which used to cover Utah, has some fossil fish that we find in Antarctica. We often find the teeth of things called ichthyodectiforms. Um, and so they look like large chomping fishes. Um, and so, yeah, you might find fossils in your area that could have been related to fishes from, um, from Antarctica. And we have other groups, things like Encodus, uh, we, we find a lot of their teeth, they're long and they're pointed and we find those all over the world. Cool. And uh, Pat, you mentioned you work on uh, fossil marine reptiles, which also are living in the ocean. Do you find the same thing with the reptiles that the similar species are found widely distributed or are the ones you find in the Arctic uh, unique? Uh, some of them definitely are distributed fairly widely. Um, some, of the, some of the larger kinds of ichthyosaurs, for example, some of the largest we know of are in excess of 50 feet, actually, you know, you know probably uh, pushing even fin whale or blue whale sized in some instances. These are very, very large animals, especially from the Triassic period. Um, and being big animals, just like whales today, they have a very broad distribution pattern. So we see that. In other cases, and often for smaller species, uh, they seem to be a little bit more, re more restricted. Um, oftentimes, although an ocean seems like a great place for things to distribute, sometimes vast ocean, vast sections of oceans are relatively sterile and biologically, they don't they're, they're barriers to marine organisms that can't cross vast stretches of water, so they, they skirt the, the coastlines, for, uh, perhaps. Um, so that, that can restrict, especially for smaller species, what you find. And things can be, for example, in the Arctic, um, I work with, you'll hear more about this later, with uh, Aubrey's going to tell you about Svalbard, and I've worked with that team for almost uh, 10 years now. And um, a lot of those things up there are unique to the Arctic only, the smaller ones. You know, yeah, that's so great. You about the oceans, that's what it looks like for fish today in Antarctica. They're stuck. Uh, they can't get out of the ocean current that surrounds yeah. Antarctica. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. It's, it's easy to forget how important things like ocean currents and the arrangement of land masses, how much they really affect the distribution of animals we see today, both on land and in the water. Um, and shout out to Aubrey Roberts, who uh, Pat just mentioned, who's going to be one of our paleontologists uh, tomorrow during one of the live streams. So tune back in for that. Um, I have a question uh, for both of you that builds on this that's from one of our viewers on YouTube, which is wondering, um, have either of you discovered a new species? So Karen, you want to go first? Um, yeah, I and I have described uh, various different new species, and we are working on um, describing many more from Antarctica that haven't been published yet. But yeah, if, um, if you're interested, the stuff that I have um, discovered and done more on is um, related to uh, batoids. I don't know if you can see hanging up. Where is it? on my wall over there. Uh, that is a <laughs> batoid <laughs> stuffed animal. Um, but yeah, I, I've worked a lot on sharks and rays in particular. So that's a group of batoids that uh, are near and dear um, to my heart, so. Very cool. And how about yourself, Pat? Yeah, I'm, uh, I've been lucky to uh, have made uh, 
lots of really cool, cool discoveries. Uh, Mother Nature has been good uh, <laughs> and, uh, and named a lot of different new species of ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, even dinosaurs. There's a um, dinosaur from Alaska right here that we've um, named Agrunaluk kukpikensis. Um, and it's a unique species of duckbill dinosaur from, uh, from the Arctic. And um, one of the fun things I'd add about when you get to describe a new species, what that really means is you write a paper with a lot of anatomical gory details, mm -hmm. and then you get to come up with the name, the two part name like Tyrannosaurus rex. And when you do that part of the process, you can use root words from any different languages, but you do have to put those, assemble those two words using very specific rules, but it's mm -hmm. a very fun and creative process. And in the case of Alaska, uh, we've named a couple of species up here actually that are using the name root words from um, uh, native peoples in their language. So, so for example, this this guy here, a Grunaluk, uh, that's the first part of the name, as, as actually comes from the Inupiaq people the, who live up in northern Alaska, and um, it's a word that sort of means ancient chewer, loosely translated. Uh -huh. Uh, and then Kukpik is to do with, Kukpik is the name of the Colville River in the Anupiak. So it's, uh, it's a really fun, I think that's a really enjoyable part of the job. Nice, nice. Totally, totally. Um, so, so Karen, you, just a couple of minutes ago, you held up um, a fossil vertebra, but mm -hmm. you mentioned it was cartilage, not bone. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Dusty on Facebook Live was wondering whether uh, we ever find soft tissue preserved? Sometimes, actually we do. Um, and so cartilage is an example of soft tissue. When we find that in the fossil record from a shark, we're, we're looking at a part that's usually mineralized. So it has a little extra calcium in it than other parts of the cartilage might. Um, but what's really fascinating is that um, in things like concretions, like what I held up before, we're noticing with newer technology that we can actually visualize soft tissue that's been preserved during sort of a biochemical process of fossilization. And so we'll find more and more um, at, as we uh, use the technologies to actually discover it. Um, so concretions are the, I think, example where I have found the most soft tissue. And again, very much considering things like sharks and rays, which have cartilage as their bodies, that's what we're looking at. Um, what's fascinating is one of one of the papers I got to, um, to write, when we used CT scans to look inside, we actually found some evidence of what was um, a nerve that was going to uh, the nasal cavity. So it would be part of what we think is the olfactory nerve, which helps um, people smell, but they would use it for a different type of chemoreception uh, back in their time alive. Cool. And when we think of sharks, and rays and their fossils. Like I often think about fossil shark teeth because those are a little more mineralized, but they also have weird things embedded in their skin, right? These things called dermal denticles. Can you tell yeah. us about what those are? Yeah, let me see are? if I have any of those with me. Um, so some, some sharks, well, most sharks, um, if you were to rub your hand on it, it would feel like sandpaper. In fact, they used to use it for sandpaper. Um, and so it has tiny little denticles. Um, it's derived from the same types of tissues that make our teeth. That's why it gets its name, the little dent. Little, little teeth. Um, and then they'll sometimes even have thorns, which are bigger um, and more prominent. They they might get hooked on a net. If, if people have ever gone fishing for skate or anything like that, it may have gotten um, hooked in there. So those will preserve um, independently. They're sometimes about the size of a piece of sand though. So we may not even notice uh, that we're walking on a beach that has them um, until we look under a microscope. And are their shapes distinct enough that you can tell the difference between different group types of sharks or rays? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, sometimes it's hard to go really, really specific, but broader groups, um, and if we expand in the clade, we used to use terms like families um, a, a little bit more frequently or orders, we can lump things into to those groups. Um, and then hopefully we find them associated with another part of the skeleton, which will help us describe it a little bit better. And so the same thing can sometimes go for teeth, um, but it actually turns out there's quite a bit of variation in teeth. And we know a little bit about that, um, um, variability to be able to describe it for phylogenetic purposes so that we can figure out how these things are related to one another. Very cool. 
Well, keeping on the theme of special preservation, uh, Zach on YouTube wanted to ask Pat whether uh, at these locations in Alaska, are the fossils you find like in the bone beds as densely packed as the ones in the Burgess Shale in Canada? So that's much older. Uh, not yeah. These are Burgess Shales 500 million years ago, but um, we uh, paleontologists have a very fancy German word for these special types of preservation when you find lots of fossils called Lagerstätten. And would you consider bone bed, your bone beds a Lagerstätten? Yeah, I think sometimes uh, it, it's, um... Uh, different people might use a different cutoff point for something being or not being a Lagerstätte, but um, yeah, our um, our bone beds, I think, in Alaska um, could well fit that definition for the simple reason that sometimes uh, one of the concepts in Lagerstätte is that um, you get either um, really a unique kinds of preservation like soft tissue, which, which we really don't get, um, but that you are containing some sort of really exceptional kind of information. And I'd say that's something we do get because uh, sites for animals that lived in polar regions, be it Arctic or Antarctic, are inherently rare. First of all, um, you know, uh, so much of Antarctic is covered in ice, of course, and, and in the polar regions in Northern Hemisphere, we have, the, uh, we have this Arctic Ocean. And um, so a lot of it isn't land anyway, but in Alaska, uh, I would argue in the Northern Hemisphere, the best record for dinosaurs that have been yet found is in Alaska. But, but that being said, there's really only a handful of sites where these bones are coming from. There's more sites with, with uh, dinosaur tracks that we know of in Alaska, but for bones, they're pretty rare and they're pretty much restricted almost entirely to a very small stretch, a couple of miles of riverbank exposures on the Colville River in Northern Alaska. Hmm. That's where we, those, those couple of miles of river we pick over with a fine tooth comb because um, we don't find a lot, but what we find is generally new and exciting. Super cool, yeah. So much to, still to be found out there. And uh, just, let me take a moment to remind everyone you can still submit your questions via YouTube, Facebook, or on our website at nhmu.utah.edu slash DinoFest. All right, well, there's lots more questions. Um, and I think one of the things that came up in the last live stream was what these polar environments were like. The fact that, you know, although the world was much warmer, you still had long periods of darkness um, and it was still relatively cooler than say at the equator. So um, one question for both of you is, um, maybe ask Pat first, um, do we have any evidence that the dinosaurs or marine reptiles you find have adaptations to living in that polar environment? Yeah, great, great question. Um, we do know that, we do know that in the case of the, the site I particularly work in, it's called the Prince Creek Formation in Northern Alaska. It's, um, we know uh, about some of the details of the climate at the time. So the average annual temperature is around like 41 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a little bit above the freezing point. It's, um, but it suggests that there were probably freezing winter conditions. And not only that, being at high latitudes, we know that those animals would have had endured very long periods of winter darkness. Um, and for a variety of reasons, we believe they were there year round. So what did they do to survive in the cold and the snow? I mean, picture dinosaurs walking through snow and um, how did they manage to do this? Well, there's a lot we don't know. A few things we can probably surmise safely. Um, with respect to meat eating dinosaurs, we've, we've come to learn from other sites in the world that um, the more sort of uh, advanced, if you were, derived groups of meat-eating dinosaurs, almost certainly we know that they had feathers. And of course, feathers are the, probably the most perfectly uh, designed insulation that exists. So for some groups of dinosaurs that live there, insulation would have been achieved through, um, through their ability to, you know, have this nice down jacket on through the winter months, just like I do every day. Uh, in other ways, we wonder, and we, we can we wonder whether some of these dinosaurs, especially smaller species, might have hibernated through the winter. Um, that's a little more difficult to test, to, to really get good evidence for, and we have not found that. But I think the, the 
the possibility exists because we know from other places like Montana that dinosaurs were actually burrowing. They had the capacity to burrow and there's no reason why, because we have similar groups in Alaska, maybe they burrowed, maybe they overwintered through hibernation. Um, so much that we don't know yet. And um, we're, we're also, I would just generally say, kind of working on the assumption that most of these groups of dinosaurs were warm blooded in the broad sense of the term to some degree, which also gave them the ability to live at high latitudes. And one of the most interesting things about that is that what it's it's not just that we find the only groups we find in northern Alaska are dinosaurs, um, we find some bird fossils and mammals. We don't find the typical cold blooded reptiles like turtles, lizards, or snakes, um, and um, some of these other other groups that are more commonly found at lower latitudes and warmer environments. And Karen, do we see any specializations in the fishes? I know that um, some people often talk about tuna being warm blooded. So are there warm blooded fishes during this time or other specializations? Well, um, the, I guess the possibility exists given the fact that tunas are just huge bodied relative to other groups of fishes. Um, and so generally speaking, I think it's it's their mass that might be related to that. Um, and we know that some of the fishes that were around at that time could in fact be much larger, but um, I'm not entirely sure uh, to, to be honest. Um, and because um, they're in the water column and as you descend within the water column, the amount of light that actually would be able to penetrate, they're, they're kind of in a dark environment as it is. So I, I'm not sure that the light cycle would have impacted them as much. And on top of that, they've got a huge migratory potential. So they could follow um, the warmer currents much like a lot of fishes do today. Um, and one of the interesting things that we know about a group of fishes that are stuck, if you will, in the oceans surrounding Antarctica is that their weather is so cold and the water is so cold there, their blood has actually been replaced by something that is like antifreeze so that they don't freeze. That's incredible. That's really awesome. Uh, so that question came from Amy on YouTube and I encourage Amy and all of the rest of you watching to tune in, uh, tonight at 5 p.m. Mountain Time for our live stream with keynote speaker, Dr. Holly Woodward Ballard, because she specializes in studying some of these growth specializations that we see um, in polar dinosaurs. And I'm sure that that topic will come up in a big way. Um, so there's uh, so many great questions coming in. Um, and one of them was just to give a sort of a bigger sense of what these Cretaceous ecosystems were like. So Karen, if you were to go back in time to the late Cretaceous to the Antarctic Peninsula, what would it look like? So if we compared it to now, it would be much more lush and green. Uh, there were trees and other plants. Um, and now there, we're lucky if we find moss. Um, there's nothing really living on the land there um, at all. So it would have been warmer and, and um, a little bit more, um, uh, I guess, I wanna, I, I wanna hesitate to say forest-like, but certainly much more lush than it was uh, today. And would you have been standing, if you go back to say some of your fossil sites, like where that yeah. concretion came from, would you have been standing on the shoreline in the middle of the ocean, somewhere in between? So right where that concretion came from, we were probably far enough from the shore, but it wasn't um, in the abyss, if you will. Okay. Um, and so what we find in there is stuff that has been washed off from land. So that would include things like um, wood pieces of logs. We find leaves, um, seeds sometimes, and we'll find other evidence of animals that actually walked on land rather than swam in the ocean. And that's how we can find dinosaurs in the same sort of vicinity of where we're finding uh, some of these other fishes. Very cool. And Pat, could you give a brief description of, uh, of Alaska during the Lake Cretaceous? Yeah, you bet. Um, I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll paint you a picture of Northern Alaska today really quickly, which is, if you're up in the, up in the areas of like, for example, where the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is and the areas that we work in today, you can stand out on the tundra and you can just look across this vast, vast, vast treeless landscape and not a tree in sight and pretty flat. And so I'll give you that picture. And then I'll also just tell you 
in the Cretaceous period, about 70 million years ago, from a variety of types of evidence, we know that Alaska was actually farther north than it is today. Mm -hmm. So today, my field sites are around like 70 degrees north. During the 70 million years ago, they were probably 80 degrees north or more. So they were practically at the North Pole. And now picture yourself on a boat going down the Colville River, looking at the rocks as you pass by and you look over into the outcrop and you see a petrified tree stump this big around in 70 million year old rocks. Wow, what an image that puts in your head. You know from that direct evidence, there were forests farther, much farther north than they are today. And that alone tells you about the climate being much warmer. But then um, to round out that environment a bit more, those forests, when we look at the kind of wood, most of that wood consists of a type of an evergreen related to the dawn redwood or metasequoia. Those are, um, those are kinds of conifers that lose their needles at every winter. So imagine a forest 70 million years ago of these conifers that lose their needles in the winter time with a few, maybe uh, with an understory of horsetails and ferns and a few occasional flowering plants probably like small trees. And that's the environment that these dinosaurs were, were living in. Um, wow, what a difference. Yeah. So, so that, um, that relates to a question actually that Patrick on YouTube just asked, which is what did Arctic plant eaters eat? Were they eating those redwood? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question. Um, we don't have really good specific direct evidence in, um, in Alaska about what their diets were. We assume, of course, in the summer months, they would have taken advantage of um, probably needles and twigs, um, in other words, browse, which the fancier word, I guess, uh, as well as certainly the ability to eat um, really any available green vegetation, potentially. We also know from other sites that dinosaurs, like duck-billed dinosaurs, may have been capable of even eating things like rotten wood um, de decomposing wood as a potential diet source. And a few people have even suggested in coastal areas they might have been eating um, types of um, algae along the, the seashore, although there's, that's really very little evidence for that. But uh, <laughs> uh, so we wish we had a better, what we really need to find are some, some well-preserved dinosaur doo-doo, some coprolite. <laughs> And cut open and um, have a look at. We have colleagues in our field that we all know, people like Karen Chin, who studies dinosaur dung uh, uh, to understand exactly what dinosaurs ate. And Karen will be on one of our live streams tomorrow, so definitely tune in for that. Um, but you mentioning things like fossil trees brings up another question uh, that came from uh, Zach on YouTube, which is, the world vertebrate paleontologists uh, in that we are most interested in animals with backbones, but there are all these other types of fossils that help us interpret the ecosystem. So when you're out there, do you guys collect or work with other people who collect plant fossils and invertebrate fossils? Absolutely. I think um, if I can, I, one of the key factors to knowing where to look in addition to the fact that the type of rock was important was um, index fossils. And the fact that we knew in this period of time of the Cretaceous, we were going to find a certain group called ammonites all over the place if, if we were in the right area. And then abruptly not see them anymore. And instead what we find are things like clams and they look like clams that we could get today. Um, and uh, so working with um, the geologists and the sedimentologists who are very interested in the uh, biodiversity and then the amount of those fossils that are in there to help us describe the region that we were in and a little bit more about the ecosystem is, is absolutely critical. Yeah, that's so important, um, understanding the whole picture, right? And um, Austin on Facebook had a, a follow-up question to something you mentioned earlier, Karen. So mm -hmm. I'll come back to you on that, This, um, which is you had mentioned applying technology to studying the fossils. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how you do that? 
Sure. So technology started, you know, with our hands and we'll use things like little picks. And sometimes that's what we need to do under a microscope. But now we can actually capitalize on things like CT scans. And so CT scans were initially um, created for a couple of different reasons. There's industry and then there's um, medicine. And what we've learned by using industrial scanners is that we can ramp up the amount of energy that's going to be involved, that we would bombard the um, electrons and, and be able to look inside this fossil to take pictures like we might at the doctors. Um, and we can do it in rock to look at this very hard material. So CT scans have been around for a very long time and paleontologists have been used been using them for, for quite a while. And as uh, machines get more and more refined and computers, get more and more um, RAM, if you will, and their, their, their load capacity is increasing. We can work with data sets that turn uh, a single fossil into hundreds of thousands of pixels for something that is as big as this little guy right over here um, and get very fine detail, which allows us to reconstruct everything from vessels inside to um, the actual overall shape. Uh, beyond CT scan, there's also things called synchrotron. And so giant um, synchrotron systems that are shooting electrons around in these giant circles that you can penetrate tiny little beams, you can actually look on an even finer scale. And this is what um, researchers have been able to use to look at how atoms collide to one another. Um, and so this is something that we've been able to adapt on, on a, an appropriate scale for looking at biological tissues um, and, and being able to apply that to, to what we do. So the 3D models that you produce from the things like the, the CT scans, the CAT scans, Sure. Those, are those only available to study by other paleontologists or are they ever available like online for the public to view? They're available in many cases online for the public to take a look at. There's two websites that come to mind right now. Um, one is hosted through the University of Texas at Austin, which is where I went to uh, my grad degree, so hook them. Um, and you can look for a website called digimorph.org and they have various different CT scans and you can look, they've, they've made models of them and they'll rotate in different directions so you can see all over. And then another um, website that's hosting a lot is uh, Morphosource. And very similarly, um, you can use these for research purposes or educational purposes, but you'd be able to see them um, as available on, on their website. Awesome. Yeah. And in some cases, you can even download them, 3D print them yourself, right? I think so. Yeah. Um, well, we only have a, a few seconds, a few minutes left, um, but I have to, since um, Pat admitted to being a specialist in marine reptiles, I'm not going to let him go without asking a question from uh, Navina in Riverton, who's wondering whether the Loch Ness Monster is real. <laughs> so the but it, it, you know, it's um, it's a great it's a great question. It's a great opportunity to think about how science works, and the way science works is uh, we we apply a concept of um, um, if when we ask questions. You know, what's the simplest explanation for something we've observed? And it's a, it's sort of a principle of parsimony, and that's a really important idea in in doing science. And so we take a look at the available evidence and we draw a conclusion that makes the most sense with the, the fewest number of steps in order to draw that conclusion. And if you look at the Loch Ness Monster as, as an example, we, we have a couple of problems because if, if um, is it real? Well, there are easier ways in many cases of interpreting the things we see floating out in a lake at a distance. Um, things that don't necessarily, they may be um, you know, a floating log, a duck, um, it may be some movement of the water because of things called a seiche, which is a special kind of a wave that works in particularly long, narrow lakes like Loch Ness. Those often are easier explanations of the thing. And if it was actually a real animal, is it easier to suppose that that that, that animal represents some long extinct group of animals like plesiosaurs, or in fact might just be something like a seal, which actually occasionally make their way into Loch Ness all the time. <laughs> so when, when you actually draw these, when you think about these things and apply scientific principles, um, I'm not saying people don't see things at Loch Ness, I'm sure they do, but I think oftentimes they're explainable. Um, first of all, not as 
the Loch Ness monster. And if and if they saw something that was an animal, it probably is not an extinct group of reptiles that lived in a lake that actually was completely frozen solid as recently as 10,000 years ago during the last <laughs> So I'm afraid well, that's my well, take on Well, to finish <laughs> up then, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna modify this question for Karen and say, okay. we know that the giant shark Otodus yes. megalodon was real, but do we yes. have to worry about it uh, while we're swimming uh, today? No, um, we do not. So this is a megalodon shark's tooth. And this is the jaw of a fairly large shark that might be around today. And you can see the difference in the size of the teeth. Um, if we thought these were around today, we, we would know, we would see them. They're, they're, they would be as big as a school bus. Um, and so that is not something that would go undetected. Um, we want to be mindful of sharks. Sharks were in the water before we were. Uh, and we can be cautious and we can also um, be safe in the water. So we don't have to be afraid of them. Uh, they are they are okay. And, well, and I think that is a, oh, go ahead, Pat. Yeah. I was gonna say one parting thought on these topics too is that um, although we often as paleontologists, we may be come across as the naysayers, I promise you, if there's anyone in the world who wishes there were still plesiosaurs <laughs> swimming in the earth, <laughs> That's me. I'd love to see one of these animals uh, in real life. And I'm sure uh, Karen would love to see a, uh, <laughs> a giant, uh, 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 you know. Pressed in the water. I think that would be a beautiful sight. <laughs> totally. Well, I think that is a perfect way to end up this live stream. I want to thank both you, uh, Dr. Karen Clayson and Dr. Pat Druckenmiller for joining us and answering all these awesome questions. And a huge thanks, of course, to all of our viewers who have tuned in for this our second of six Polar DinoFest live conversations happening this weekend. Um, our next uh, live stream will air today at 5 p.m. Mountain Time um, with our one of our Polar DinoFest keynote speakers, Dr. Dr. Holly Woodward Ballard. Um, and remember that um, this week's uh, live stream um, conversations this weekend kick off 10 weeks of Polar DinoFest exploration with the new dinosaur video from one of our guest paleontologists being released each Friday between now and April 2nd. Um, you can see the complete live stream schedule and watch each Polar Dino Fest video when they become available on our website at nhmu.utah.edu slash Dino Fest. Um, and if you've uh, missed uh, any of the previous live streams, you can uh, check those out on our website, YouTube channel and Facebook page world where they'll be posted after they're finished. Um, and don't forget that our current uh, theme for Polar Dinos Fest for this year's Dino Fest is inspired by our current special exhibit, Antarctic Dinosaurs, which is open at the Natural History Museum of Utah through April 4th. Be sure to book your tickets in advance online uh, so you can experience the exhibit in person. Um, and finally, uh, Polar Dino Fest has been made possible by the Alternative Visions Funds and Utah Legislature, as well as Utah Division of Arts and Museums. And thank you so much to these sponsors for helping us uh, bring Polar Dino Fest online and alive. Um, with that, I want to thank our, our experts uh, once again. Thank you so much and hope you have a great rest of the day. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Every year, NHMU's DinoFest brings you face to face with the world's top paleontologists and their incredible discoveries. Now, in its fifth year, DinoFest is going online with 10 weeks of virtual exploration of the frozen world of polar dinosaurs. From the Alaskan North Slope to Antarctica, dinosaurs are found on all seven continents. But how did they survive at the extreme ends of the Earth? Join us online each week starting January 23rd as we introduce a different paleontologist whose research has helped uncover a thriving polar world far different than what we know today. Polar DinoFest starts online January 23rd and continues through the run of our special exhibit, Antarctic Dinosaurs, open through April 4th. Don't miss it.